Here are two families in the United States. They have similar incomes, right? However, one family is considered impoverished and the other is not. How could this be possible? Who decides who's poor in the United States? How poverty is measured? Well, the answer to these questions take us back to the 60s. The booming economy after World War II brought tremendous prosperity to the country, but millions of Americans were left out. When President Johnson launched the war on poverty in 1964, the U.S. Census Bureau needed an accurate way to identify the poor and to see if the government was winning the battle to end poverty. But guess what? There was no official method to do it. That's when Molly Orshansky, a government statistician, developed a simple way to do it. At the beginning of the 60s, an average American family spent about one-third of their income on food. So, Orshansky calculated the cost of feeding that family using the cheapest government food plan. Then she did some simple math. She multiplied the cost of that food plan by three to obtain the poverty thresholds for families of different sizes and compositions. If the household total income is less than the threshold, that family and all its members are considered in poverty. Since the Census Bureau needed a benchmark, this was adopted as the official poverty measure. Each year in September, these thresholds are just updated by ad adjusting them for inflation. Several researchers, journalists, politicians have criticized this measure because not only the food plan was unrealistic for minimum everyday life, but also because the measure is absolute. A family that earns even one penny more than the threshold would not be considered in poverty. Another shortcoming of this, method, of this methodology is that, it, that the cost of living could be more expensive or less expensive depending on where you live, and this method does not take this into account. Some authors have stated that this measure lacks validity in contemporary times because food is a lot cheaper than it used to be, but other necessities cost more, like transportation, childcare, or healthcare, for example. This measure overstates poverty by ignoring benefits such as food stamps, subsidized housing, and childcare, for example. It understates poverty by ignoring expenses such as transportation, healthcare, and rent, which take a huge bite out of family budgets. Some authors have stated that this measure does not take into account the diversity of deprivations and others have stated that it does not reflect the severity of the situation. Without an accurate way to count individuals and families in need, we don't know who's poor in the United States, and this impacts policies, programs, and the most important thing, people. I come from Mexico, as you have probably noticed it because of my accent, right? And in Mexico, we innovated a few years ago the way we measured poverty. As an economist, I was very curious to try to adopt this methodology here in Mississippi. So, I conducted a research study with another researcher from the University of Mississippi in which we tried to measure poverty using a multidimensional poverty index. This multidimensional view is based on something called social exclusion. And you might be thinking, what is social exclusion? Well, social exclusion is when an individual is being deprived of mainly two things. One is basic human rights, such as education, decent housing, access to healthcare. And the other is when individuals cannot fully participate in the society where they live. So, if an individual is socially excluded, that individual has a limited ability to participate in that society. Social exclusion does not only see poverty as a market phenomenon, but as a result of social, cultural, and institutional processes. This methodology suggests us to understand poverty as a consequence of certain overlapping deprivations that the individual is experiencing at the same time. One of the benefits of this methodology is that it's based on national and historical 
context. So, the level of deprivations is measured according to the view of that nation's standards of well-being and cultural norms. Another benefit of this methodology is that it's very useful for policy analysis. Since the results of this methodology represent and suggest certain characteristics of the poor, policymakers can assess the functionality of social programs or determine changes in the allocation of their budgets to tackle those characteristics that the population lacks the most. A multidimensional approach measures poverty more accurately since it not only captures command over market goods, but it includes all their dimensions of welfare that are needed for the development of human beings. This methodology has been adopted by countries in Latin America, Europe, Asia, Africa, but it has not been fully adapted for the United States. Now, I want to share with you some of the results from our study in Mississippi. Using the official poverty measurement, the poorest counties in the state of Mississippi follows the traditional view that those are the ones that are in the Delta. But comparing it with our methodology, it gave us surprisingly results. The distribution changed. And the poorest counties in the state are no longer those that are in the Delta, but are located in other areas in the state, as you can see on the map. The darker the color, the more poor is the county. And as we can see, the distribution is not the same. Now let's take Ponano County as a specific example. Ponano County has a poverty rate of 17%, one of the lowest poverty rates in the state of Mississippi. But by using our methodology, it was one with the highest. And you might be thinking, why? because more than 30% of its population, 25 years and over, do not hold a high school degree. More than 18% of its population has a disability. More than 11% of its population, 25 years and over, do not hold or have health insurance coverage. More than 10% of its population do not have a complete kitchen facility. 21% of its population has monthly housing costs that represents more than 30% of their income, and approximately 4% of its population speaks English less than very well. All these indicators tend to increase the probability from suffering poverty. By saying this, it is not meant to say that one single indicator or index can capture all matters in all settings. There is no general consensus on what dimensions to include or how they need to be weighted. But economists have agreed that nutrition, child mortality, schooling, standard, living, sta living standards, or social integration are important dimensions that affect the poverty situation of the individual. And all these are beyond material living standards. So, a multidimensional poverty index that follows these guidelines should represent an accurate picture of what poor people experience on their everyday life. The winners of the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics, Avjit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, concluded on their book, Good Economics for Hard Times, that poverty is not the result of the inferiority or inadequacy of a group of people, but is the result from a systematic exclusion. And this method can quantify how excluded they are. It can impact the life of millions of Americans and hundreds of thousands of Mississippians that suffer from this condition every day. So, when it comes to poverty, how we count really does count. I hope this talk can start a conversation on how America measures poverty. Thank you so much. <laughs>